Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is John Bruner. I'm the program chair of the O'Reilly Solid Conference coming up in June. And I'm here with one of our speakers, uh, the man who is headlining the data track at the Solid Conference, Dr. Michael Chewy, who is a partner at the McKinsey Global Institute. Hello, Michael. Hey, John. How are you? Very well, thanks. Uh, delighted to have you with us today. Um, at, uh, at Solid, you're going to be talking about um, a, a new and important uh, piece of research that you've been that you've been working on lately. Uh, why don't you just give us a quick rundown of, of that? Well, it, it's not the first time I think anyone who's uh, joined us has heard of the Internet of Things. We, we first wrote about it uh, almost five years ago. Um, you know, but as it's uh, you know become increasingly salient, you know, as the as the uh, awareness has certainly arisen, you know, beyond the uh, tech community, uh, we thought it'd be helpful to 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 update our perspectives. And you know, we're we're cognizant of um, you know other researchers who have looked at this phenomenon before. And what we try to do is um, you know add some additional insight to some of the things uh, that that those who have gone before us and 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 ourselves actually have have written. So we. Um, you know, uh, basically, are, are finding some additional uh, points of interest. I think, which will uh, guide both the uh, producers of the, of the technology as well as the users. You know, we looked at uh, things through a different lens in terms of the the way we we cut up the world, uh, and and then we have some interesting insights about you know where value can really be found because you know it's it's fine that uh, that there's a lot of hype associated with this because at the end of the day, this is. This is uh, truly something that we believe can be transformative. And, and to be frank, you know, we think maybe the hype is uh, not misplaced, but underplayed in terms of what that potential might be. But it might take a lot longer to actually capture it than, uh, than uh, you know, somebody who thinks of this as a fad um, you know, might, uh, might need to, uh, to, to take in order to, to really do something. Right, right. And, the, and this hype that you mentioned is kind of like the, uh, the Internet-connected refrigerator idea or something like that. Well, I'd love to have one of those too, but uh, I think there's plenty more uh, beyond that. Even you know, you know, comparing consumer versus uh, B2B applications. That's some of the research that we did. Excellent. And uh, so, what what areas have you have you looked at here? I mean, I think we, you know, it, it's the it's the consumer area that really captures the imagination of of the press and of people who who are sort of general readers of this kind of thing. Uh, you've looked at some some industrial and and uh, you know critical B2B areas, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the first thing we did was, um, you know, cut the world in, a, in what we think is a bit of a, a novel way. Um, you know, it's very, it's very uh, natural for many of us to look at the word in, world in terms of industry verticals. So, you know, whether it's automotive or retail or consumer products or, you know, uh, uh, healthcare providers, et cetera. And we think that's valuable as well. Uh, but, you know, one of the uh, reflections that we had as we were looking at, you know, hundreds of different use cases and potential use cases uh, of, 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 of IoT uh, is that you know at, at, at base you know these systems are sensors and devices embedded in the physical world and so another way that another lens that we used was looking at uh, these um, use cases in the context of the physical environments uh, in which these uh, systems are deployed so everything from the physical body so that's you know wearables and injectables and ingestibles etc as one place where IoT can be used the home, um, mm -hmm. offices, uh, places where knowledge workers work, or factories, uh, which are standardized production environments. And by that, we include not only manufacturing, but hospitals, for instance, or at least where care is provided. Uh, work sites, which are custom uh, production environments, places like mines and uh, upstream oil and gas and uh, you know, forestry environments. And I think we, we, we thought that just cutting the world that way um, you know, allows us to develop some insights that, that, that uh, Otherwise, would have been difficult to do because in some of these settings, you have multiple sectors actually intersecting in different places. Mm -hmm. So I, that's one thing that we did. You also made right reference, and we've talked a little bit about the B2C versus B2B. Um, you know where the value is, and you know by the way, you know as you said, a lot of the hype comes about as a result of uh, you know the all the B2C stuff that happens, and it's it's easy to write about because you can talk about your connected refrigerator, your connected home, uh, uh -huh. you know the wearables that you can wear around. And by the way, we do think there's tremendous value there, huge amounts of value. However, when we looked across all the hundreds of use cases that we studied, there's double the amount of value in B2B applications as there are in consumer applications. And so if you really want to know where the value is, it really is in places like um, industrial internet. It really is in, in, in logistics and manufacturing and, and um, you know, many of those applications. Again. Uh, you know, there's plenty in, in consumer. And in fact, I think the other thing that we'd observe is 
you know, as much interest as there is and as much, you know, the real value you can capture from some of these consumer applications. It's really the B2B to C applications where we think you can even multiply the amount of value. So, you know, when in fact, you know, what the consumer health care health monitor can be connected to my provider, to my doctor, and have that continuous stream of health data actually connect up to the professional health care system. That's where we think a lot of value can be created. You look at uh, the smart home and connected home applications. Again, you know, the, you could, you know, manage your own energy better as a consumer or as a family. Mm -hmm. But when you can connect that up with a utility system and, and, and uh, you know, potentially demand response and, you know, differentiated pricing, or, you know, at peak, et cetera, again, as a society and as an individual and in, as, as a broader electrical grid, you can see even more impact. So this idea that you know, looking beyond just the pure consumer to to the B2B and then the B2B to C applications, I think is one of the findings that we'd say is important. Excellent. And so walk us through, uh, you know, what what one of these chains looks like with something like the um, the connected home connected to a utility, uh, the B2B to C, um, or rather that's the C to B2B. Um, what does that what does that chain look like? I mean, are we talking about a you know, a multi-decade adoption period, especially on the consumer side, or is this something that'll that'll happen pretty fast? But walk us through the chain and talk about how that might develop. Yeah, I mean, I think the um, you know how adoption works is is tricky, hard to predict. And I often say I'm not in the prediction business. Uh, you know, I, I try to identify potential. A lot of things that have to happen uh, as you go forward. Um, but certainly, I, I think uh, a lot of times there are spikes in uh, consumer adoption. You know, when when there's a when there's a, a category of, uh, uh, of consumer devices, for instance, that uh, becomes hot. So whether it's a smartwatch or in some cases, you know, a, a smart thermostat or the ability to control um, uh, lighting in a home or security in a home. And so oftentimes you'll see a spike there. And then the infrastructure has to be put in place on the, on the uh, B2B side. You know, and, and that's, that varies depending on the utility. You know, clearly a, a lot of you know, smart meters, for instance, have, have been put in place there. But I guess it, you know, this adoption curve and how long it takes calls into uh, uh, you know, one of the other findings from our research that at the end of the day, many times you know, the achieving the maximum value from this technology is really a systems problem. And so again, you know, in some cases you have multiple actors. So again, consumers have to buy a certain number of things. The technical infrastructure has to be placed, put in place by the utility. But then the pricing, which by the way in many jurisdictions also involves um, you know, the, the regulatory bodies, et cetera, has to be put in place. And so, you know, you, from there you see you have consumer preference and consumer acceptability, uh, mm -hmm. the design of those devices, uh, and then you see on the, on the, you know, on the, on the commercial or on the enterprise side, uh, you know, a decision to make investments there, the actual deployment, and then, of course, the, the broader regulatory framework. All of those things need to come together, um, you know, in order to, to achieve the maximum value. Uh, and that's true in this in the, in the case of energy management, as it is in many others. Right, right. So those are those are some of the um, some of the obstacles, some of the things that that uh, that will have to come together. What do you see as as driving this? I mean, is it is it principally technological development and the ease of deploying this kind of thing? Is it a business motivation and the realization that uh, you know that this can help? What, what do you where do you assign some of the some of the drivers? Well, at the end of the day, the, you know, the, 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 the fundamental um, analysis that we did was economic. And so clearly there's a, uh, uh, you know, as we looked at it, trillions of dollars of potential uh, economic benefit that can be achieved by using these technologies. And again, if you, if you look at, you know, you know, double the amount of potential in, in B2B or, or enterprise uh, applications, enterprises generally, uh, you know, are, are at least relatively sophisticated about understanding where economic value uh, comes from. And so I think that'll be a lot of the driver. That being said, as you said, a lot of other enablers have to be put in place. And, you know, on, on a micro basis, um, you know, an engineer uh, who's interested in, in designing someone, a maker, uh, will do it because it's fun and it's interesting. It's technology you can deploy and uh, there's something driven about that. And in many cases on the consumer side, has a lot to do with consumer preference. Has to do with behavioral economics, which aren't necessarily completely, you know, you know the uh, the econ, the uh, perfectly rational economic actor. Uh, at the end of the day, the day, I think a lot of the, the the drivers will be economic, but the the specifics about how things get adopted many times have to do, you know, more with 
you know, people's awareness, uh, understanding, commitment uh, to prioritizing something that, you know, for instance, that they they want to spend um, money on something that uh, you know is a wearable or or works in their home. Um, right. And and that's not to say that you know business decision makers also aren't affected by what their peers are doing. Right. 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 You know, you you mentioned the the individual um, engineer, even the individual maker here, and I think that's to me one of the really critical technological developments is that this area is now approachable by individual engineers and even hobbyists, the the makers. Um, this stuff is becoming more abstracted and more modular. You know, you can approach hardware now if you have nothing but a software background. Uh, it's it's all programmable. It's all software defined. It's all digital. Um, I I think. And then I think in turn that will drive a lot of this adoption because these people are going to develop modular hardware that has some sort of abstracted API on it. So if you're developing a smart home application, you don't have to understand the constraints under which utilities operate. You don't have to imagine the entire stack all at once and develop it out. You just have to develop something that has you know, a decent API for other people to, to connect to. I totally agree. And I think one of the remarkable things about you know, if you view the IoT as combining the virtual and, and physical worlds, um, you know, it used to be that we spent a whole bunch of time, you know, understanding what can be done in the physical world, whether it's, you know, retailing and buying things and then understanding how to do that on the web and mobile through e-commerce or, you know, all kinds of things that we've, uh, you know, found in the physical world and then you know, tried to create the, the analogs for in the virtual world. You know, now actually that, 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 that locus of innovation or the inspiration of innovation can go in the opposite direction. So as you said, you know, APIs into physical objects now are being created. So you know, if you're a software person, you can start to do that. You know, some of the other techniques which are interesting, you know, the idea of doing experimentation, of, of doing um, uh, you know, behavioral uh, customization, personalized offers, something that we do naturally, A-B testing, something we do naturally on the web, something we do naturally with mobile. Now we can bring all of those techniques, you know, from the virtual world, from software into hardware, and I think that's uh, mm -hmm. exciting as well. Yeah, it brings some of the scalability of, of software. It, this is, um, you know, this is this is a lot of uh, a lot of my theory behind the new hardware movement, the IoT, uh, is that you know about ten years ago we started to see the emergence of the idea of big data, uh, and that has become the the main business imperative, the main management imperative of the last perhaps five years, is that you instrument, uh, measure, optimize everything. And uh, the first places that this could happen were places that are online, right? That where the business is encompassed digitally, uh, where you're throwing off a lot of data naturally over the course of operating. And so we've already seen it transform these industries that are, that are entirely online, right? Finance, uh, advertising, you know, online retail, marketing, areas like that. Um, and now, as I imagine it, you know, hardware and, and IoT are bringing this kind of mentality, this kind of, uh, uh, you know, stack and, and these kinds of tools into areas that haven't previously been encompassed by the Internet, right? Um, everywhere from agricultural fields to oil platforms. Um, these, are, these are areas that haven't yet been subjected to the kind of data-driven management. Absolutely agree. I, I think this idea that you know, this is all, uh, you know, these things are all closely related. And a lot, a lot of the levers for value, a lot of the ways in which we can improve our lives that, that big data enables, um, you know, now, you know, we're, we're finding out you can extend that to greater places. It also extends the risks, of course, as well, you know, whether it's cybersecurity or privacy or uh, intellectual property or confidentiality as well. It, 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 uh, but it expands that ability to, for all of those things to happen. So, uh, you know, I think this software to hardware, um, uh, move is, in terms of innovation is quite powerful. Yeah, speaking of risks, you know, when you talk to uh, enterprise executives, uh, and what are they worried about? What are they? What's holding them back? Well, you know, certainly, you know, there are a bunch of technology things that need to be solved. But many times, uh, you know, the cyber risk is is one that uh, you know comes with for, you know, the Internet of Things. Uh, in some ways, in, in at least two ways, multiplies the risks associated uh, with cybersecurity. First of all, it just increases the surface area of potential breaches. So, you know, not only is your data center, not only mobile devices, not only uh, notebooks now can be vectors uh, for breaches, but now when um, you know all kinds of physical devices, and you know we've seen press coverage of, of various uh, breaches which occurred actually through internet-connected devices or, uh, or IoT devices. So you know that that's one additional set of risks 
But then the, the other you know, way in which IoT actually increases risk is that it, it quite frankly increases the consequences of a, a breach. You know, what happens when there are a million connected cars which can be hacked or a nuclear reactor or a chemical plant, et cetera? And by the way, we are starting to see some examples where that starts to happen. So those risks are real, and um, you know we're definitely, uh, you know, as as much as it's become a C-level executive uh, topic to talk about cyber, uh, once you start adding IoT to it, it, it truly becomes something that people need to pay a lot of attention to. Yeah, and uh, you mentioned sort of C-level uh, C-level attention here. Overall, you know, where's your sense of of kind of where the Internet of Things? Um, exists as, as a strategy level? Is it something that the CTO is talking about? Is it something that the CTO, CEO is demanding of the CTO? Uh, where do you see this getting driven inside these organizations? Well, there's a lot of individual variation. You, know, I, you, you mentioned big data, you know, analytics, et cetera, and I, I think you know, in terms of the level of awareness, this is lagging behind those concepts um, you know, by a few years. Uh, but I think it'll probably play out in a similar way. Um, you know, the, the, Lots of people who are interested in the technology, you know, geeks like us, um, you know, we, we've heard of it. We're interested. We, we sort of get and you know, trying to figure out what it all means and, and, and how to derive value from it. And I think the the broad uh, swath of business and you know, organizational leaders, you know, whether it's public sector, private sector, um, you know, NGOs, etc. Now, I think awareness is is building in terms of, but it, you know, in terms of what it really means for their organizations. Um, that's still a question, right? And that's where I think we saw a similar thing as people started thinking about data and what data means for their businesses. So it's a little bit before that. I, I think, you know, as, as we talked about, I think organizationally, um, IoT can be quite challenging. So, you know, even, you know, if you assign it to a CTO or you assign it to a CIO, first of all, that never worked before, even for traditional IT. But now, um, you know, if you're a, you know, a CIO, you typically thought, you know, that my domain of things that I can uh, need to worry about are the data center, maybe some mobile devices, and you know, some some notebooks. Mm -hmm. But now, uh, you know, when IT is truly embedded in the physical assets of the business, in the inventory of the assets, in the inventory of the of the business, you know, now, you know, what you do is really linked uh, with business outcomes. It's really linked. Your, your metrics are no longer, you know, what's your cost for a server, what's your cost for a cycle, what's your cost mm -hmm. for storage, you know, but what is your conversion rate in a store, right? And you know, sometimes you, if you talk about a retail environment, the CIO, you know, your, your job stopped where the POS stopped. Mm -hmm. um, and now, you know, you're touching the merchandise, right? And the head of store ops never really had to worry about you. Just make sure the transaction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now you both have to work together, and I think that's, you know, that's going to cause tremendous uh, um, transformations in terms of the level of integration of IT with the with the rest of the business. Yeah, the the convergence of IT and OT, right? Yep. Um, the the convergence of information technology and operations uh, technology. Um, I hear a lot of people talking about that. What do you? Is that something that uh, that that you hear a lot of? Sort of uh, uh, fear around, or excitement, or um, what do you what do you hear about IT and OT coming together? Yeah, no, I couldn't agree with you more in terms of IT and OT. Uh, it is uh, that that concept is is being talked about more and more. Um, you know, when we you know again, there's lots of different individual variation from company to company. Um, I don't know if, if it's uh, trepidation or if it's excitement so much as this is a problem we've got to solve. Mm -hmm. uh, we recognize now that. When you embed IT, you know, not only in the devices that we thought were IT, but in the rest of the business, uh, we're going to have to understand that. And you know, the, you know, the the traditional business leader, uh, you know, the general manager, et cetera, is going to, in fact, have to learn a lot more about what these systems mean, what connectivity means, what standards mean, what interoperability means. Uh, and then the IT folks, you know, we always said that they need to be business leaders, but more than ever now, because when you embed yourself literally in the physics of the business. You're going to have to understand how that works and how you can help drive real business outcomes. Right, right, right. So how how do do we need to see organizational changes in in the way that sort of you know IT IT departments and 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 uh, you know people who have traditionally worked on the OT stuff uh, work together? Certainly, we'll have to. Now, I, you know, I think uh, you know we view organizational uh, changes not only as lines and boxes, but literally the practices and processes of how things work. And um, you know, clearly if if the OT people, the people who are you know, driving business outcomes, running operations, et cetera, are going to have to rely on IT, embedded IT, Internet of Things, in order to do their jobs, they're going to have to learn more. They're going to have to be aligned. They're, 
to have to work together. In some cases, you might see those organizations converge. That already happens in financial institutions, where mm -hmm. you know when the data center is the factory, then in fact you know the the chief operating officer often is the, the you know the the highest level uh, IT person. Uh, I'm not saying that's going to be the the perfect organization for every type of organization, but we will see an increasing convergence in terms of IT and OT. Mm -hmm. I, I I hear from a lot of uh, companies that I talk to that there's a lot of anxiety over expertise and the um, you know where you find it. A lot of companies have built up plenty of expertise in, you know, the web stack. Uh, if you imagine uh, what the, the last couple that I were talking to happen to be in advertising firms, uh, you think of how a lot of ad agencies have built up big digital operations, right? And and they can act very quickly with a lot of in-house expertise to uh, to build digital systems, uh, online systems. And now now their clients are asking them to work on physical stuff. To they want interactive kiosks, you know, interactive experiences for people, anything anything as, as basic as like, you know, go up to a vending machine in a grocery store, tweet about Tide, and you get a Tide sample packet or something like that. And they're looking around and seeing that having built these giant digital organizations, they don't have hardware organizations. And, um, you know, there, there are a lot of uh, consulting firms that will do the full stack digital stuff for you. There aren't a lot of consulting firms that will do the full stack hardware stuff for you yet. Um, doing everything from conceptualization to design and prototyping and then manufacturing and and deployment. So where do, where do you see the you know the expertise for the IoT coming from? It's again this is a you know we talked a little bit about how IoT is you know following along in the path of uh, of big data and analytics and one of the things that we identified as we studied big data and analytics a, you know, a few years ago is this looming gap for talent and uh, you know a similar kind of thing is, is happening here. Now some of the things that are helpful is is understanding that some of the learnings that you have from digital and some of the learnings that you have from data can be brought over as we just talked about some of those examples. Some of the learnings about design for instance also, um, you know whether it's physical design or, or online design, some of the, the concepts about using ethnographies and being user-centered, you, you can bring them over as well but you know it it is helpful to understand the hardware itself and it it, it is a, a level of expertise uh, fortunately we you know there are lots of places wh where uh, you know some expertise around hardware does exist uh, but in many organizations which thought of themselves as just purely digital purely online and, and mobile now as you said um, need to understand the physical world a little better um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's uh, that that definitely is a, a need right and it's something that we think about a lot I mean the um, you know, it, it is becoming easier to get into the physical stuff, uh, and you know, the it's hardware is becoming an agile discipline, um, just like the web. But it has a long way to go, and and um, uh, I'm astonished whenever I look into the kind of step-by-step -step process of developing hardware, uh, the kinds of really technical considerations that you need to make. Um, we're having a, a pop-up factory at Solid, which is really cool, an actual electronics manufacturing line. In the the demo hall, uh, and um, our our associate co-chair David Craner is running it, and I've been in the um, in the back and forths between him and the partners who are doing the manufacturing, and everything everything comes down to uh, to extraordinarily technical questions about you know how the enclosures work, how many impressions you need to make in the injection molding, uh, you know the the impedances between the electronics, and then of course the software experience on top of it. And that there hasn't yet evolved a hardware platform that's as easy to use as like a, um, a, a you know, a, a PHP or a WordPress or something like that that we're used to on the web or, or an Apache if you want to go a level down. Um, it, 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 has, it has some way to, to go, but I think it's becoming more accessible as a full stack um, kind of, uh, it's becoming more accessible to full stack experts. You can't you can't quite be a full stack hardware expert if you don't have any software expertise yet. But increasingly, I think you can be, say, an electrical engineer and know what the full stack is for manufacturing hardware and for deploying it and sort of what the considerations are. I agree. I think things are definitely moving in that direction. But as you said, you know, details around materials matter. Details around heat matter, and and uh, so it's uh, there's a lot of learning that goes on if you haven't come from the hardware realm before. You know, my firm just bought a, a design firm, for instance. Uh, there's some real capability here that uh, hmm. people need to, to, to gain. Yeah, talk about uh, the, the design firm a little bit. That's an interesting 
uh, you know, we hear a lot about design as a core corporate competency. So, what? How do you see? How do you see that that working out? Well, you know, I, th I think design and thinking design has has always been important. But um, you know, uh, what, one of the things that we'd identify is, um, you know, we, we, our our research has has prim primarily been around the uh, the economic potential of some of these technologies. But when you look at the um, adoption of these technologies and use, um, you know, small things make a big difference. Uh, you know, the the concept of the, of affordances, for instance, uh, you know. If if you need a sign to tell you what to do, it probably wasn't designed well. Is another way to put it. Uh, and so there's some real skill in trying to figure out. And you know, I'm an apostate uh, UX guy actually, right? And so there's a real skill to being able to identify and gain the insight into you know what it is that somebody's doing, and then what it is that you know the tool that will provide them with the best uh, ability to uh, actually accomplish what they need to do. Yeah, and and uh, tremendous strides have been happened. In software, right? I mean, there was a time when you bought a piece of software and you got a big manual associated with it, right? And now, you know, when I download, you know, an app onto this device, uh, I don't expect to have to read anything in order to start to use it, and and that's that's uh, you know that just sets the baseline for design quite high, um, you know, in 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 the online world, and we've done that already, right? And so, you know, now what we need to do is is continue to keep that baseline high. You know, as we take our learning from software into hardware, and then you know, to be honest, there have been hardware designers and there have been people who've been designing things from furniture to light fixtures for for many years who know a lot about this as well. And we we need to leverage to those skills as we bring, you know, the internet as we bring the the software skills, um, you know, and and embed them in physical world. Right, right, right. And those people who have been working in these areas bring a lot of insights. Um, you know, I think uh, manufacturing as a design input. Is a term that Joey Ito has used that I think is just a wonderful idea. Um, you know, you you can't you can't really design something until you know how it'll get deployed. Uh, it's or rather, it's the deployment that can become an inspiration and and you know a uh, a suggestion for the design. When you know the limitations and the possibilities in the deployment, uh, you can do great things in the design. I think that's another case of where the Internet of Things you know can take some of our learnings from. Uh, online and, and mobile, and move them into the physical world. So, you know, in the, in the manufacturing realm, we've had DFX, you know, design for X, design for manufacturing, design for cost, design for value, all those sorts of things. Many times, you did that prospectively. You said, you know, the, you know I, I think this is going to work. I think we won't need this cost, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But now, when you can instrument your products and they can report back, you can literally find out what really is driving, uh, you know, failure modes. What's driving maintenance costs? What's Driving additional value for your customer, uh, and then be able to adjust your design based on that. So your DFX can actually include some of those uh, some of those things which previously you couldn't measure. You were you were you were just asking that question. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And how so is that? We're now we're going back to the idea of sort of measurement and uh, and and optimization, right? Is this the, is this a how how new do you feel that imperative really is in, in management? I don't think it's necessarily new, but you know, as we did our research and we looked at some of the IoT systems that are that are already out there, and we asked ourselves, you know, how much data already exists, and you know, lots of these devices are already connected. How much of that data is actually used? You know, some of our colleagues spend time on uh, offshore oil, oil, excuse me, offshore oil platforms, which have 30,000 sensors on them. We did analysis of how much of the data that's actually thrown off this exhaust data is actually used for decision making. Mm -hmm. Less than one percent of that data is used at all, uh, and we find this again and again and again. Which you know, this exhaust data is, is literally just thrown away, and, mm -hmm. and even data that is used in a lot of these you know IoT or connected systems, which already exist, most of it's used for two purposes: just um, anomaly detection, so alarms, uh, or real-time control, just making sure that things are coordinated. As we looked at the value you could achieve from instrumentation and measurement. A lot more of it could come about if you actually use this data for optimization, for optimizing processes or prediction. And so, again, if you just look at not even deploying new devices, but the data streams that already exist that are embedded in the physical world, number one, you could use a lot more data that's out there which exists already. And number two, you can transform that use from, you know, simply from, you know, alarms and, and real-time control to optimization and prediction. And, and there's just huge opportunity to do that. Yeah, yeah. I just tweeted that statistic, by the way, as you were talking. I think that's a, that's a, an amazing thought that less than one percent of this IoT data on these oil platforms is used. Um, 
What's the constraint? Is that a bandwidth constraint for transmitting the data back for analysis? Is it an analysis complaint, a constraint? Is it not knowing what questions to ask? So there definitely are some technical constraints. Uh, you know, again, if you look at all the data that's generated on a flying aircraft, there's not enough bandwidth to send it all back to an analysis center. Similar to oil platforms, that particularly offshore, and tend to be in uh, far off places. So sometimes there's some bandwidth constraint. Um, more often than not, it's just simply not actually having concentrated on the problem, uh, yeah. which is to be able to understand, you know what, there's a lot more that we could do with this data. Uh, and so, you know, data exhaust is data exhaust because it gets thrown away. I mean, there's another constraint that we discovered as well, which is, um, you know, as I said before, a, a, an increasing number of the physical products which are being produced actually do have sensors in them and many times are, in fact, are connected products. But they usually are only connected to the manufacturer. And mm -hmm. so again, if you go back to that, that upstream oil and gas uh, example, you know now it, all of those sensors uh, are deployed, and they're mostly deployed, you know, by the manufacturers of the individual components. Uh, the question that we ask as part of our research is, what's the value of interoperability? How important is it actually to capture value that that uh, these systems can talk to each other? Well, we found, for example, in that case, that you know, as much as you could do predictive maintenance on each of those individual components, pumps, et cetera, that are on that oil platform, almost 60% of the predictable failures required you to actually have data from multiple components, to mm -hmm. actually have interoperability. And if we look broadly across the, the, the hundreds of use cases that we observed and tried to understand what the potential value of using IoT in those use cases is, mm -hmm. something like 40%, almost half of the value, requires interoperability. I think is a, a bit wow. of a striking result. Uh, yeah. So with that, you know, if, you, if you're a, if you're a producer of the technology, you, should, you ought to think about if again, if you want to be on the side of your customer, figure out what it means for these systems to talk to each other. Just to be clear, when we talk about interoperability for that statistic, it's not vendor interoperability necessarily, but interoperability between two IoT systems, which each of which can fulfill a use case, but then together can fulfill even more use cases. So yeah. that's I think it's a, a, a remarkable result. And, and, you know, if you tie that back to the other, you know, finding that we had, which is that a majority of the potential value actually comes in B2B context. In a B2B context, the customers of IoT technology tend to be big companies that are sophisticated in their procurement. When they realize that half of their value of IoT won't be captured unless they have interoperability, I think they'll increasingly ask for that to be specified when they actually buy these systems. Mm -hmm. So again, that will push, I think, towards more interoperability between these systems as well. So right now, this yeah, let's let's uh, let's dive into to the to the upstream oil and gas example a little bit. Um, the, this the it's not. Uh, there isn't a lack of interoperability because of any kind of sort of malicious intent on the part of the vendors, right? It's that these these uh, these are often uh, this is often equipment that's under maintenance contracts from the vendors, and so the vendors have put IoT kind of monitoring and sensing in, and now we're finding that that really the value to be captured needs to come from from you know working across a lot of these sensors. That's absolutely the case. Now, uh, you know, I, I certainly want to, wouldn't describe malicious intent, but certainly I, I think many companies are realizing, you know, the data stream that I, I have is valuable, uh, mm -hmm. and, you know, describe it as proprietary. And so overcoming some of those individual agency problems are, um, you know, one of the things that uh, I think we'll need to figure out if we're going to capture the full value of interoperability. In many case, so in that case, I think it's the customer who will say, you know what, um, I am missing out on a lot of my value unless these systems talk to each other. Mm -hmm. So, you know, vendors, you need to get together and, and, and make this happen. Got it, got it. So, um, oil platforms, uh, you said 30,000 uh, sensors on a typical oil platform? 30,000 now, 60,000, um, you know, as, as, as we go forward is, 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 easily, is easily possible. Got it. And these are, it's a range of, um, of, of sensors on actual equipment as well as kind of uh, environmental. Exactly. Sensors. Primarily yeah. on the equipment, but, uh, on, you know, all kinds of sensors. Yeah. And um, are these typically sort of sensors that, uh, that have been on this type of equipment for a long time but are only now getting connected to the Internet? Well, I, I think the number of these sensors and uh, so again, it's not the first time somebody has decided it would be good to, to know the temperature or the pressure of something, particularly right, in these right. environments which are extremely challenging. Um, but because sensor technology is improving, because connectivity is improving, you know, we're just seeing the number of them ramp up as each generation of the platform gets, gets built and designed. 
Right, right. So uh, yeah, I mean, walk us through walk us through the environment on a on a platform. Tell us about sort of what's what's involved. Well, I, I don't spend a lot of time on uh, OS platforms, <laughs> but you know uh, you know our colleagues who do is there. Um, but you know, first of all, it's tremendously challenging in terms of the depth and pressure, et cetera. And so already, in order just to to do the drilling itself, uh, a tremendous amount of information, uh, you know, uh, you know, is is delivered. But you know, I think one of the other things that's incredibly important is that you know, depending on what oil prices are, you know, uh, you know, an hour of downtime, a minute of downtime, uh, costs a lot, a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And uh, this idea of using IoT to improve maintenance um, is is power, an extremely powerful thing. You know, we, we sometimes said that there are two, you know, uh, primary modes of maintenance. You know, one is wait for something to break, and then fix it. Uh, or, or you know check on it every once in a while, right? And that's that's true as, as in healthcare as it is on an oil platform. Uh, you know, wait till I get sick and go uh, treat me, or or you know go in for my checkup every once in a while. Um, you know, the IoT what you what you can do is transform maintenance from uh, you know as my my colleague Devin says uh, from a process r repair and replace uh, to pre predict and prevent. Hmm. And again, if if you can just reduce you know the number of Hours of, of uh, you, know, you know as we call it you know uh, downtime uh, you know unplanned downtime on on one of these rigs uh, there's a tremendous amount of value that you capture there uh, and so you know I think we the, the maintenance uh, opportunity is, is absolutely huge here. Um, now you mentioned uh, that the the immense cost of downtime and uh, that's something that uh, that I've heard used against this stuff as well. Um, you know, any kind of new technology uh, can be tricky to implement, uh, and I particularly hear it used uh, in in talking about sort of what kinds of companies will be able to supply this kind of technology. Um, we're all, you know, heavy industry has tended to be um, an area where large established enterprises deal with other large established enterprises, and sometimes when I talk with engineers at you know auto manufacturers or um, you know companies that, that need immense kinds of infrastructure, mining companies, uh, you know, res natural resources and so on, uh, logistics, they all kind of uh, say, ah, these kids in Silicon Valley think that they can, you know, take a PC and put it in my factory and that it'll, and that it'll be fine, but if my, you know, these things crash and when my line goes down it costs a million dollars. Do you think that there is an opportunity for startups to, uh, to supply this kind of uh, this kind of technology, or are we looking at um, at enterprises supplying other enterprises? Uh, there definitely is an opportunity for uh, startups to uh, pr provide some of this technology, but I, I wouldn't minimize the challenges in uh, in in selling into large enterprises. Uh, you know, they have procurement departments, uh, as you said, that they view risk um, in some cases quite conservatively. Um, and so, you know, partnering methods, I think, is you know, is often very helpful if you can find, um, you know, embed yourself as part of a, a broader solution with someone who already has access. Um, but uh, you know, I, I think again, the analogies are are, are uh, quite similar in many cases. Um, you know, to IT, whether it's web on, and mobile, etc. Um, you know, we see startups who are providing mission critical types of uh, applications. You know, which if they went down would have tremendous uh, uh, negative effects for for companies, and they need to earn the trust of a large enterprise if you're going to play in that space. Um, more than ever, that's also true here. But some of the the playbooks you can take, including uh, partnering with those who who have who have access and understanding, um, uh, and can bring that uh, bring that access to a smaller company, I think is quite powerful. Um, mm -hmm. Whether that's you know people or or, or um, uh, you know other firms. Excellent. And uh, we have a question from Twitter that I'd like to take and just uh, remind our viewers that if you'd like to send us a question to discuss, you can tweet under the hashtag IoT Profiles. Um, so the, the question is essentially um, how, how sensitive are the companies that you are talking with about owning their data? Um, do a lot of these technologies involve giving away your data um, and, and you know risking that kind of uh, proprietary insight? Um, or, or are these companies able to hold on to it? I think this is one of the you know topics that you definitely have to address. And again, this is one of those areas where IoT just makes the you know, the big data analytics question bigger, which is, you know, who who owns this data? What rights do you have uh, to it? You know, quantified self people. There's a great story from a couple years ago where 
you know, people who had pacemakers wanted the data from their pacemaker because they all phone home, right? And the manufacturer said, no, no way because of HIPAA, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it's in my chest. Give me my data. Um, so, you know, I think this is a, a, a question that's going to be answered in the specific rather than in the general. Um, but there is great value in potentially sharing data. We published a, a, a report on open data. What happens when data becomes more liquid, when it becomes shared between organizations and individuals, et cetera? And you can multiply the, the value uh, that you can achieve by data, you know, you know much like you know, uh, you know, when, when you have more eyeballs, all bugs are, are, are shallow. When you have more data, more eyeballs on data, you know, more insights uh, perhaps can be generated. Um, mm -hmm. But of course, you know, there's a proprietary advantage that comes from having data and analyzing it. And so you know, viewing data as currency you get as something that's a tradable asset can be quite powerful. Interesting. You mentioned, by the way, uh, healthcare, quantified self. You, you had mentioned this earlier uh, in the context of, uh, I think you said, ingestibles and injectables. So going beyond medical devices, these are things that you actually put in your body? Yeah, I, well, some of these you are described as, uh, you know, you would describe as medical devices as well. So, mm -hmm. for example, the camera pill that will, you know, uh, take several thousand pictures of your GI tract as if... Uh, makes its way through uh, is a medical device in fact and you know we, we would describe that as an example of IoT and then you know if, if you look into the future of what's possible um, you know a device that you might uh, you know inject and, and be able to, to provide um, information about you know whether it's blood mm -hmm. sugar or, or other things that currently would have to go to labs to do um, you know again that continuous data stream can be much more powerful for prediction um, you know rather than that very periodic sense of of, you know, I took my blood pressure, I took my glucose, I took, you know, my you know, hemoglobin, A1C, you know, at a point in time, and, you know, let's take a look at it later. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this, uh, you know, I think the, the barriers to adoption in the medical field <clears throat> are interesting to talk about because uh, they're pretty visible to all of us, right, uh, when, we, when we go to the doctor. <clears throat> and uh, to me, my, I should say that my wife is a doctor at a, a leading uh, medical center here in the Bay Area, and spends all of her time faxing things back and forth. So, <clears throat> what, what are the what are the barriers here? I feel like we've been talking about intelligent healthcare for a long time. Um, you know, waiting for this kind of connected environment to come along, uh, and we haven't yet seen it. So, what where's the inflection point going to be? Do you think? Well, you know, there's a bunch of things that you know are are true. Um, you know, I've I've sometimes said on occasion there are three sectors of the economy which have really lagged in terms of, uh, you know, achieving the benefits that come through additional IT, whether it's, you know, Internet of Things or more broadly in their public sector, healthcare and education. Um, and part of those is because we care a lot about them, and so we regulate them heavily. And so that, mm. that's, uh, you know, provides safety, but also in, in some cases uh, inhibits innovation and in, inhibits uh, certain types of uh, investment. So, there, you know, there's a regulatory regime about it, something that we care about it so much that, uh, acceptance actually can be challenging as well, and so, you know, we, you know, uh, you know what, I, you mentioned the word ingestible, for instance, or injectable. You know, not everyone's going to feel very happy about, you know, inserting something uh, uh, or swallowing something, which is, uh, you know, a connected device, for instance. And so there's some uh, uh, challenges there, um, you know, within the industry. And then, you know, as, as you think about, we mentioned skills before as well. Um, you know, I have some physicians in my family as well. Uh, and they, they have, they've had to study a lot in order to, you know, try to make people well, but then, you know, add a whole bunch of IT to the, to the requirements for, for them, and that, uh, you know, that really, um, you know, can be quite a lot of uh, uh, burden in terms of things to learn. And so, uh, you know, there are a number of challenges that uh, I think exist there. But mm -hmm. at the same time, um, you know, I, and I, let me add one more, which is, you know, certainly true in the United States, perhaps less elsewhere, which are the incentives or some of the benefits that these technologies can provide, mm -hmm. um, which are, for instance, being able to provide care at a lower price and better outcomes. But in fact, the incentives, in many cases, through the payment systems that we have, uh, aren't to <laughs> uh, provide incentives for higher care at, at, at lower prices. They are often to you know drive volume and drive revenue. Um, right. And so, but you know, some of these things are becoming un unlocked. So we do see innovation in payments, which is driving the right incentives towards, you know, better outcomes at, 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 with more efficient methods. And, you know, I think that will incent additional adoption of uh, IoT and personalized medicine and, and some of the things that, uh, uh, that you can enable using these technologies. Mm -hmm. 
And, and medicine is also interesting, I think, because um, we've seen uh, demand directly from consumers for some of this change. I mean, it, through the quantified self movement in particular, um, do, do you think that that, that that is actually bringing pressure onto the, uh, onto the institutions, or is that um, just sort of a, a sideline that's happening in the consumer side? I think the quantified self movement is uh, terrific at sort of providing uh, examples of what might be possible. Um, um, but I, th I think the, 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 the broader ability to gain access to data um, and be able to bring it uh, to the professional healthcare system I think does push uh, the frontier of, of, of uh, what, uh, what the professional healthcare system uh, needs to do. And so, yeah, I think it is one of the things that's pushing things along, um, uh, along with some of the other factors, such as just looking at the economics of healthcare in the United States. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'd like to take uh, just one or two more questions from uh, from our audience before we uh, before we wrap up the hour. Um, another question from Twitter from uh, New England MRA. I'd love to hear how you think IoT will change aftermarket services like uh, CS warranty and recall. Well, I guess that's customer customer service warranty and recall. Yeah. No, I think you know. So first of all, I mean, I think it has a lot of uh, implications on the on, uh, on the maintenance side. So the extent to which some of these things are, you know, about uh, repairing and replacing, you know, versus uh, predicting and preventing, I think that can be quite powerful. Um, you know, but then if it just, you know, there's there's tremendous uh, um, costs associated with uh, return and recall, just in terms of tracking, et cetera. And again, if you if you can get these things down in a way that uh, you know reduces your uncertainty about where where uh, those devices are as they come back, you know, the the stream of what they went through before, you know, something went wrong. Um, you can derive a lot of insight from them. And being able to, you know, I think this is something that we're seeing increasingly as well in the manufacturing space, you know, broadly, uh, you know, companies that make things, is um, being able to connect uh, services, you know, back to product development. And I think that's a channel which has uh, traditionally, not been as strong as it as it should be. When things are returned, you know how much uh, does that information come back? But even more importantly, the data about what devices are already doing when they're uh, fielded, um, you know, and, and bringing that back into the product development process. And I think being able to close that loop uh, is one of the things that IoT uh, can help to do. Yeah, yeah. I've um, I was talking with someone who works at uh, Apple the other day who said that in the first uh, few months after a new iPhone model comes out, if you bring a, your iPhone back to the Apple store with some sort of defect, they take it back, no questions asked, give you a new one, and then mail your defective iPhone to the engineer responsible for the area in charge of the defect. And so the engineers in Cupertino are sitting there with giant stacks of iPhones on their, on their desks, all with you know identical cracks in the corner of the glass or something like that. Um, but, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you, one ought to be proud when the stack is quite small on your desk. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Going, going to instead of inbox zero, uh, defect stack zero, right? Exactly. But that's that's the kind of feedback you're talking about, right? Where you you have this insight from the field as to how your your products are performing. Exactly. Um, do you think uh, what what sort of value do do these companies need to offer to 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 uh, to their customers in return for that? It, it's obvious in. It's obvious how this model might work, where you have a service contract, where you're, say, a big, you know, supplier of industrial equipment to a sophisticated buyer, and you can see that this is how you keep your service contract costs down. Let's say, in the case of consumers, um, uh, to go back to the, the web-connected appliances, you know, um, white goods makers would love to have performance data on, say, microwaves that they sell. Right? When are these things breaking down? How are people using them uh, in practice? Um, you know. Before consumers hook up the microwave to their Wi-Fi network, they're going to ask what sort of value they're actually going to get from from this connectivity. But what do you think? You know, what do you think we'll see in terms of that that balance? I think this topic actually gets to a number of the things we talked about already. So uh, it does get to, you know privacy, right? So this is a privacy concern. It does mm -hmm. get to who owns the data, uh, and it does get to uh, consumer behavior preference, uh, or if not consumer, you know, at least behavior and preference about what you ought to do. I think at the end of the day, what it requires is a deep understanding of, of, of where value is for your customer. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that's how you get a customer to share. Uh, well, there are lots of ways. To, I think the, 
the, the way that you get a customer to share with integrity is to tell them you know, the data that you're taking and why you're taking it and, then, and yet still give them a compelling value proposition for them to share that data with you. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, you know, on the online space, you know, lots of people, sh you know, share, freely make data available to social networks, which, you know, and, and yet they've been provided back with, you know, the utility of, you know, gaining access to information or gaining access to connectivity with friends, etc. Again, I, I think the same kind of thing will be true as we talked about connected devices, uh, whether it's consumers or whether it's, you know, industrial customers. Um, mm -hmm. If you want that data back from a, a, a system, from a, um, you know, whether it's something that's in your home, something that you're wearing, or something that's in a factory or a hospital, um, you will increasingly need to provide a compelling value proposition back. And it might be that we're going to continue to improve your product in place. Mm -hmm. IT will allow you to do that. Right? You know, you give us insight, we'll make sure that we continue to tune your product over time. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you provide that data back to the individual or data back to the enterprise so that they can better manage their business, better manage their household, better manage their health. Yeah. But I, I think it's, it's, it's powerful to think about if, if you want data, um, you know, you want to give some value back. Yeah, that's such a powerful implication of the software-defined machinery that we're seeing. I mean, we've, we've um, you know, Tesla is such a terrific example uh, where they were able to respond to concerns about uh, debris puncturing the undersides of their cars by putting out a software update that lifted the suspensions of the cars by an inch, right? So everyone walks out and all of a sudden their car is riding an inch higher and less susceptible to this kind of underbody damage. Um, or, you know, in terms of performance, they put out updates that extend the lives of the batteries that make the cars more performant, um, you know, make the acceleration more fun. So you have a physical good, and it's actually improving over the, over the course of, of its lifetime, which is something that, you know, we've almost never seen before in, in physical goods, but, but that we routinely see in software. I mean, every time you log into Google Docs, it's a better product. Um, this, 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 you know, points the, the way toward... Uh, something that, that often comes up that we haven't talked about much here, the, the move from selling products to selling services. Uh, you know, I've heard people at GE say that their strategy is, is um, going from generators to generation, right? Instead of just selling the machinery or selling the service, obviously the connectivity is a, is a huge part of that. Um, do, you, do you see, hear, hear a lot of this from, from the companies you're talking to, um, a, a, a push to move from selling goods to selling services? Absolutely, over and over again. I think what IoT allows you to do is uh, to create these services, or rather than you know selling something as a, a big capital good, uh, being able to provide that as a service. And we see it in the consumer space, whether it's you know buying transportation rather than buying a vehicle. You see it in the uh, in the enterprise and industrial space where you know you might be buying you know, thrust as a service or transportation as a service, etc. Um, you know, it's, and it, it has tremendous value for the, the customer who, again, no, no longer has to necessarily manage, um, you know, capacity because you can just ramp it up. Um, you know, you can describe it almost, you know, I, I've described transportation as a service as car as cloud. All those mm -hmm. characteristics, uh, self-provisioning, um, you know, OpEx instead of CapEx, um, you know, the, the ability to analyze the data, et cetera. Um, as you said, yeah, improving of the products uh, in place without you needing to do them. Uh, all those characteristics, which we figured out how to do in IT, now can be applied to a whole bunch of things which we, you know, previously bought as physical products. That's an amazing promise, and, and I think it's incredibly exciting um, to see how how all of these fields are going to be transformed. And um, I'm really looking forward to hearing more from you about all of this at uh, at Solid. So we're at the Likewise, bottom. Likewise, I look the... forward to being there. Oh, thank you so much. Um, we're delighted. And uh, we're at the bottom of the hour, so we'll, uh, we'll sign off and, and let you get back to, to your work. Um, for viewers who have enjoyed this, you can hear Michael's talk at Solid at 1.15 p.m. on Wednesday, June 24th. Uh, if you'd like information on the Solid conference, visit solidcon.com. And uh, if you'd like a, a discount on your, on your pass to Solid, use the code HANGOUT, all one word. Um, let us know that you uh, that you watched this and and uh, uh, and are joining us at the program. That's uh, the discount code Hangout at SolidCon.com. Uh, Michael is going to be headlining an entire track full of uh, insights about how companies are using data uh, from machines, from the Internet of Things, to improve their operations and improve their businesses. We have another track that's called Intelligent Enterprise uh, and Intelligent Manufacturing. That's about sort of how a lot of uh, you know heavy industry. Companies from heavy industry are, are using connectivity and hardware to improve their operations. Michael, thank you so much for speaking with me today. It's really been a pleasure. 
Likewise. Thank you.